Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. You ask for a specialist in the food addiction space who relies exclusively on whole plant-based food diet, and we heard you. On today's episode, we bring you the fast-talking Dr. Alan Goldhammer. Along with fruits, vegetables, grains, nuts, and seeds, he also advocates a food plan free from added salt, oil, and sugar, SOS, as you will hear him refer to it in the interview. We thought it was important to discuss the vegan approach to food addiction recovery because there's many in our community who eat this way too. What's most important is that you find what works for you and what is true for you. What we learned in this interview is that these two food camps are not so far apart. They both aim to eliminate processed foods, sugars, and fake convenience foods. They just have different takes on sources of protein and volume of food that need to be consumed to maintain each lifestyle adequately. You may need to pause rewind and re-listen to this episode as these two fire back and forth with nuggets of recovery information. Listen carefully to what Dr. Alan Goldhammer states about his water fast and realize that the people he does this with are inpatient and medically supervised, not done on their own at home. Hope you enjoyed the show. Welcome to the Food Junkie Podcast. My name is Dr. Vera Tryman and I am your co-host today along with Clarissa Kennedy. Today we are speaking with Dr. Alan Goldhammer. Dr. Goldhammer is a chiropractor and founder of the True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, California. This center is a multidisciplinary practice that includes doctors, chiropractors, naturopathic doctors, and psychologists. Its specialty is to offer an inpatient therapeutic water-only fasting program to treat a range of conditions such such as hypertension, diabetes, autoimmune disorders, and even cancer. Dr. Goldhammer also utilizes a nutritional medicine approach that is plant-based and is based on what he calls the SOS, no added salt, oil, and sugar. He has been interviewed for primetime documentaries such as Vegan 2017 and Vegan 2018, What the Health, Fasting, and Forks Over Knives. Notably for us, he is also co-author of the book, The Pleasure Trap, Mastering the Hidden Force that Undermines Health and Happiness. This is a must-read for all who follow plant-based programs. We are thrilled to speak with him today about veganism or plant-based food programs and food addiction and how, or food addiction recovery and how these intersect. So welcome, Dr. Goldhammer. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. All right, so we want to get start with the personal, so whatever you're willing to disclose, we're always interested in knowing how you got into the field of food addiction or sugar addiction or the pleasure trap and the vegan lifestyle. So what was your moment when you realized that the pleasure trap was a crucial piece of the puzzle for many people in regards to their overeating, weight gain, and ill health? Well, you know, that really was a slow evolution over my experience as a clinician where I saw that, you know, the majority of people in our society that are sick and suffering have metabolic syndrome, obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, autoimmune diseases, cancers like lymphoma. This makes up a huge percentage of the patients that are out there. And, you know, I started to wonder why, why was, why were these problems so common? And, you know, if you really go back and you look at where humans evolved from, you realize that humans evolved in an environment of scarcity that we were in an environment where the biological imperative of life was get enough to eat and don't get eaten. And most humans that were born, most modern humans, never lived long enough to reproduce. So their genes were not passed on. They were the losers. The winners, our ancestors, were the ones that managed somehow to get enough to eat while avoid being eaten, and they live long enough to sexually reproduce, and they passed on their DNA. And when you think about it, modern humans 100,000 years ago And modern humans today have essentially the same anatomy, the same brain, the same biological drives. But what's changed is not our brain. What's changed is our environment. We changed our environment. 
the innovative creatures we are as humans, we figured out how to do many things since the Industrial Revolution, not the least of which is processed foods. So we increased the caloric density of our diets by realizing that the higher the caloric density, the more favorable food was perceived by the brain. Because that brain, you know, was trying to get enough to eat. It wanted to get as much as it could whenever it could. And if it was successful, it lived to reproduce. Today, that can backfire because now we live in an environment that we've changed and we have all these hyper-processed foods. And so now if you eat to satiety on highly processed foods, you will gain weight. You will become overweight and eventually develop metabolic syndrome and the diseases of dietary excess. The difference between somebody that gains a lot of weight and gains a little bit of weight isn't often discipline or even knowledge, it's the sensitivity of their satiety system. So every, you know, there's a bell curve. Some people are more sensitive than others. Some people can eat highly processed foods and they won't become particularly overweight because they feel full with relatively small intake. Other people are less sensitive and they will overeat and as a consequence, they will gain weight. And that's largely the difference between uh, what you see in people on otherwise similar kinds of diets. And so the problem today is those people with highly efficient systems, i.e. the survivors, that have less sensitive satiety mechanisms, given highly processed foods, will become fat. The only question is, how much overweight will they become? And that's largely determined by you know, their own individual satiety system. Or if they choose not to eat the highly processed foods, they can fool their brain. And so that's the cruel reality. Today, people are struggling trying to desperately figure out how to lose weight or keep weight off, but not recognizing the most fundamental basic issue here, which is that what regulates how overweight you are is largely your, the brain satiety mechanisms in combination with the food that you try to put in your, in your face. And so what we've learned at the True North Health Center is that if people eat a whole plant food diet that doesn't have added salt, oil, and sugar, Most people can eat to satiety and yet still maintain optimum weight, or if they're overweight, lose weight. And we even know the rate with which they're going to lose it. We know that if the average woman on a whole plant food SOS-free diet with moderate exercise will lose two pounds a week down to their optimum weight. Now, some people, highly efficient systems, maybe they only lose one pound. Some people might lose a little bit more. Males, on average, lose about 50% faster because they're full of testosterone, which is essentially a fat-burning hormone. And we talk about if you injected enough testosterone in women, they'd lose their fat, but they'd get hairy and get cancer and die. So it might not be a good strategy for weight management. If you inject enough estrogen in males, they grow breasts and hips and and gain extra fat. So we know that some of the differences are biological. We know some of the differences are just inherent satiation mechanisms. And some of them are what type of diet you put into people. So can so, I stop you, uh, Dr. Britt, can I stop you here? Because you're, you're, this is really interesting, but I want to talk about some of the mechanisms behind what you're saying. So sure. you've got the sort of law of satiation, which has got components that I'd really like you to flesh out. And also the, the, pleasure, the pleasure trap with this motivational triad. I mean, yes. those are things that are explaining what you're talking about. And let's hear a little bit about them. So people are motivated by what we call the motivational triad. They want to seek pleasure. They want to avoid pain and they want to conserve energy. Now, this energy conservation is not known to a lot of people, how fundamental that is to our motivation, but it makes sense when you think about what I said before about evolving an environment of scarcity. People that wasted their energy didn't live to reproduce. People that were able to conserve their energy had greater success. And seeking pleasure and avoiding pain, avoiding pain is is obvious. Pain is there to let us know that there's a problem. And seeking pleasure, pleasure is there to know that there's an issue there. Things that are pleasurable are associated with dopamine production in the brain. And the more dopamine, the more pleasure. And pleasure is there to drive behavior that in a natural setting favors survival and reproduction. So it's not surprising that the only two natural behaviors that are intensely associated with dopamine production are food and sex. Food and sex drive our behaviors because food and sex are rewarded with dopamine. But humans got really clever. And we figured out that there were ways to artificially stimulate dopamine production. And one example is drugs. Alcohol stimulate dopamine production. People like the way it makes them feel. The problem is because it's an artificial stimulation, you can become addicted. The definition of addiction uh, by its very nature is that people have to continue to take the substance, not just to seek pleasure, but to avoid the very real pain of withdrawal. 
And so where we've gotten a little bit aggressive is we, people recognize that drug addiction and they realize that, yes, artificial stimulation of dopamine we can lead to addiction and addictive behaviors. What we're suggesting is that the chemicals that are added to the feed, for example, if you take rats or mice or birds and you put these certain chemicals in their feed, they'll gain 49% of their body weight in 60 days. Now, they are not gaining weight because of psychological issues. It's not because they got stress or Right. Mommy didn't love them enough or daddy loved them too much or they had problems. It's biological because there's an artificial stimulation of dopamine in their brain. And the chemicals that will make rats and birds and mice gain weight are salt, oil, and sugar. We talk about SOS, the international symbol of danger, and also stands for salt, oil, and sugar. Salt, oil, and sugar are not food. They're chemicals added to food to stimulate dopamine so we like it better. And the more salt, oil, and sugar you put in the food, the more dopamine's produced, the more pleasure there is, the more you like it. But it's an artificial stimulation, and it can lead to addiction. Now, I'm not saying that eating sugar is the same thing as snorting cocaine or smoking cocaine. But the reality is it stimulates the same neurochemical pathways. So even though cocaine may be more powerful, more addictive, more short-term dangerous, sugar can also act on the same kind of pathways. And so now people have to keep taking sugar, not just because they want the pleasure of sugar, but because they feel very real pain and their brain is signaling them there's real, very real danger when they stop eating it. And sugar does a few other things besides stimulate the motivational triad is that it also stimulates insulin production. And when the insulin goes up, it drives the sugar down. And when the sugar goes down, your brain says, oh, we're in danger. We're not getting enough food. Go get me some food and no more salad. That's not going to fix it. You get me some nice, highly refined carbohydrates to feed my addiction. And so you get the cravings and the binging and people are oftentimes attributing these things strictly to psychological issues. And I'm not saying there aren't psychological issues and people manage stress in different ways, but a lot of these cravings are biological. And the reason I say that is I can take a patient, take them to the True North Health Center, put them on a whole plant food SOS free diet. And in relatively short order, a lot of those cravings and those powerful feelings and the urge to binge begin to subside. We well, haven't this, solved their psychology. We've just affected their biology. Exactly. Yeah, we, yeah we're, we're on the same page here. So Dr. Goldhammer, that would be, a, is it fair for me to, to uh, interpret that your concept of the pleasure triangle is basically simply food addiction or sugar addiction? Or salt, well, the salt pleasure water. trap could be from drugs. Right. It could, it could be from it could be from food. Yeah. And the thing in the food that tends to stimulate that artificial dopamine is salt, oil, and sugar. Now, yeah. you know, sugar is the most obvious, and it's probably yeah. the most nefarious. But you know, interestingly enough, if you look at salt, which you think, well, how could that have anything to do with weight loss or weight gain? Why would eating salt have anything to do with obesity? There's no calories in salt. It's huh. just an essential nutrient without which you would die. But the reality is that the salt stimulates something called passive overeating. So if you just take a person, in other words, it fools the satiety mechanisms. If you take a person and say, let's have you eat brown rice until you're full, till you reach net. At, a, at some point, people say, I don't want any more. I'm full. I've had enough brown rice. They reach satiation. And if you just tested that out and figured out how much rice does this person, everything else being equal, need to reach satiation. And the next day, everything else being equal, you salted that rice quite heavily. You would find that the point where you felt you got enough was more. You would eat more. Now, people say, well, of course, it tastes better. Well, what do you think tasting better is? It uh, means more dopamine stimulation. Right. And so if salt or oil or sugar can stimulate more dopamine, you'll like it better. But the net consequence is you eat more before you feel naturally satiated. Okay, now, so, so let's, let's go to that now. So, so that's the pleasure trap. But now you keep mentioning satiation. You've got some very specific concepts behind this law of satiation. Let us know about that. Well, there's a number of things yeah. that tell the brain you've had enough. First, let's go to the animal world. You notice if unless animals are fed refined carbohydrates or highly processed foods, there's no obesity. Even whales, which people think of as kind of fat, are actually 9% body fat. They're very, they just wear their fat on the exterior. But they're, they're not fat. They're lean, mean machines. And so are all the other animals unless they get access to our kind of highly processed foods. Because satiety works on a whole natural food diet. You eat to your full, and that's enough to keep you, you know, enough without too much. It's only when you start highly processing food that those satiety mechanisms become deranged. And as a consequence, that's the danger of salt, oil, and sugar. It's also the reason why people are overweight. 
if you take away the salt, oil, and sugar, you take away the obesity. But tell, us, so, tell us about this. You, you, you write about the stretch sensation and then sure. the yellow circuitry. You want to so about- one, one, one method by which your brain knows you've had enough is based on how much volume of fiber. So when you take the fiber out of food, like refined carbohydrates, you yeah. don't get the stomach being filled up enough to feel full. For example, if you fill up a human stomach with, say, potato, it takes about 500 calories before it's mechanically full. But if you put 500 calories of bread in the stomach, it only fills about a third of the stomach. Mm -hmm. So uh, 500 calories of bread won't provide the same level of satiety that 500 calories of potato would. So that's why it's so much easier to gain weight eating refined carbohydrates like uh, white flour and sugar and these products than it would be eating potatoes and sweet potatoes and, and vegetable materials. Now, okay, so the goal is, is to stretch out to, to reach that sense of satiety. Right. But you also have fat sensors. And uh, so when you eat fat, say, in whole plant foods, there's, you have a better, more accurate satiety feedback than when you highly process o- into something called oil. Mm-hmm. So that's another mechanism. And of course, you know, sugar doesn't just affect, it's not just the empty calories. It has a profound effect on the microbiome. Now you have, if you took a human being and divided it into human cells and non-human cells, like protozoa and bacteria and viruses, et cetera, there'd actually be more non-human cells than human cells. So a 150 pound person would have more non-human cells than human cells. And five pounds of those organisms are living in the microbiome, or make up the microbiome that are living in your intestinal tract. Five pounds, that's over a trillion creatures. Now these are living, breathing, eating, and defecating creatures. You have five pounds of creatures pooing in your intestinal tract right now. And what they poo inside you can largely, could vary. It could be things like TMA, which is, becomes trimethylamine oxidase and can be highly irritating and contribute to bowel cancer and heart disease. It could be vitamin K, which is an essential nutrient, which you need. So what you got to say, well, what determines what your bacteria poo inside you? It's what you feed them. So if you feed your bacteria the food they're designed to eat, that is the soluble fibers, your potatoes and your sweet potatoes and your vegetables and your fruits, you get fertilizer. You feed them animal products, meat, fish, fowl, eggs, dairy products, highly processed foods, you get a completely different microflora. And that's why people say, well, how could salt affect the microbiome? Well, think about it. Salt's used as a preservative. If you salt meat, the bacteria don't break it down uh, as readily. If you take a high salt intake into a bacteria-rich environment, it's not shocking to hear that you maybe affect the microbiome. If you're eating sugar, you get a different microbiome than if you're eating fruits and vegetables. So people that are eating these varied, highly processed, highly refined diets have different microbiome. Well, that microbiome is important, not just for satiety and for nutrient production, but it's also an important part of your immune system. You know, some people suggest that it's the microbiome that largely protect us from many, including infectious illnesses. And so we want to have a healthy microbiome to protect us, not just from getting heart disease and cancer of the breast, prostate, lung, and colon, and autoimmune disease, but even dying from things like influenza or COVID or all these other infective agents that we're dealing with. So, so the foods that we're eating, these nutrients, they give us a sensation which the, the, the ones that are more favorable towards evolution are a more positive sensation? I How think that we, the, more, the more caloric density, the yeah. better the pleasure. And that's the trap, is because your brain was not designed for an environment where there was sugar, oil, and salt. It was designed where there was no highly processed foods. And the last 100,000 years has not been enough time biologically to evolutionarily change that. So your brain is the brain that was designed for an environment where there were, there were no temptations of salt, oil, and sugar and highly processed food. Right. And you right. put that brain in this environment, and then you have a big problem. And that's why two-thirds of people are overweight or obese. If you're not overweight, you're actually abnormal. You don't want to be normal. You want to be healthy. And healthy people are not overweight, but most people are because most people are eating these diets, and you can't help it. People say, well, I could just be disciplined. No, that doesn't work. But let's just think about it. Do we tell alcoholics, just have a little discipline and don't drink so much? Does right. that work? Do we say, yeah. well, put your alcohol on a smaller plate and put your spoon down between each slurp and you won't be an alcoholic anymore? Huh. What do we tell alcoholics? 
Right? What so, do we do? Stop. You gotta yeah. stop drinking. I, actually, the, the, uh, just on that note, I was gonna ask you that later. Do you believe that there's any possibility of moderation of the SOS, the salt, tr- uh, salt oil? Well, just like some people can have a drink or two and not become a drunk. Okay. If you're a drunk, it's not you. Okay. And not- some people can have a piece of chocolate or a chunk of cheese and not become overweight. But if you're overweight and struggling, it may not be you. So okay. instead of lying to yourself or lying to others and saying, well, I'm going to just moderate, I'll just have one. Why do you think they say in that ad, bet you can't just have one? They're not yeah. kidding. And so if you're not the person that can have, you know, the bit of the thing and put it away and not think about it, then you have to just like the alcoholic has to realize, okay, I can't just drink beer and wine. I need to stop drinking. I need to come up with a strategy to not consume the chemical that's fooling my brain, which may be alcohol or cocaine. Some people have to say, well, you know, sugar's not for me. So other people, maybe they can have a little bit and not get into too much trouble, but it's not for me. And so it's going to be a lot easier for me to say, well, I'm just going to come up with a strategy where I don't consume that rather than continue to tease yourself and then wonder what's wrong with you or how come you're damaged goods and you can't control it, when in fact the biology of it doesn't favor you controlling it. And you don't tell alcoholics, well, you're a freshly recovered alcoholic, go become a bartender. That'll be good for you. Put yourself in an environment where you're constantly being stressed. If you're struggling with weight, a good strategy would be, let's try to create an environment where I'm not constantly being bombarded with temptation until I develop the habit patterns and discipline so that, you know, it's not going to be overwhelming for me. But we don't do that. We okay. send people home into an environment where they're constantly being stressed. Okay. So let, just as a sum up for people who are listening. So, so uh, really, what, th- this has been the theory of your pleasure trap, which is the concept of the pleasure trap itself. And then the law of satiation, which is, has been askew with the foods that we're eating. And you actually talk about in your book that the processed foods are like these magic problem foods that mess it up. And that's like high fat foods and low fiber foods and uh, I guess low caloric dense foods like processed foods. So let's look now at what... what well, is- it would actually be high calorically dense food. So it's low yes. nutrient dense, yes. high yeah. caloric dense food. Okay. Natural foods are high in caloric yes. density, yes. low in caloric... In high in nutrient density and low in caloric density. So then you have this concept that you call the true north diet, or I guess it's the true north internal compass, which is what we want to get back to. Do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. So it, then- tur- it turns out if you decide to experiment and do a diet that's exclusively whole plant foods that's free of added salt, oil, and sugar. Okay, so that will be, you know, fruits and vegetables, minimally processed grains, beans, perhaps some uh, limited quantities of nuts and seeds. If you eat those foods, satiety tends to kick in about the area where amount of calories you need to maintain optimum weight, not necessarily current weight. And the sugar levels start to stabilize and the insulin levels stabilize so you don't get as much binging and craving. The volume of the food is quite large because think about it, you know, salad only has 100 calories a pound, fruit 300 calories a pound, potatoes, rice and beans 500 calories a pound. And so the amount, you have to eat many pounds a day of food in order just to get enough to sustain your optimum weight. Whereas with the concentrated foods at 15, 16, 18, 2,500 calories a pound, you can hardly eat anything. So you won't get the satiety feedback, you'll get the sugar bouncing, You'll get the, uh, you won't get the normal mechanisms kicking in. That's why I'm just amazed people aren't bigger than they are. Yeah. When you look at what they eat, it's a miracle that people are only as overweight as they are. On the other hand, if you try this as an experiment, what you're going to find is you're going to lose weight. You're going to feel better. People don't come back to me and say, you know, I did all that diet and it wasn't worth the trouble. I didn't lose weight or it doesn't work. That's not what they say. They but you say actually it's, say, it's you actually say in the book that, that you cannot gain weight on, on a, a, a true north diet. I'm basically where you're following the non-SOF. Well, what we say is you can't, you can't maintain obesity. I think you can gain yes. weight if you okay. work hard enough on just about yes, anything, particularly for females. You know, a highly efficient female with a lot of estrogen, even eating too much whole plant foods in terms of complex carbohydrates and stuff, sure, you may not be able to lose that last few pounds. You know, if you eat it, you may have to regulate your, the quantity of certain foods, particularly very concentrated foods like nuts, seeds, avocado, higher fat foods. You may have to portion control those in order to be able to achieve optimal weight. But you do not see people eating whole plant food diets that achieve and maintain obesity. It's just, okay, that's it's, a great, great term. So tell us about your food plan and, yeah, just basically what the, well, it's, what the it's actually a very flexible plan because it varies on individuals, but it always is exclusively whole plant foods. 
So everything we eat is either a fruit or vegetable, grain, legume, nut, or seed. So it might look like this. We, we generally encourage people to limit their feeding window to about eight hours a day if they're trying to lose weight or yeah. 12 hours a day if they're trying to gain weight. So we want them not eating three to four hours before they go to sleep. And sometimes we'll even encourage them to delay breakfast a little bit to get a little bit of exercise. And we know that after a 12-hour fast that the weight that's lost with exercise seems to be proportionally uh, weighted towards fat. So they don't eat before they go to bed. They get a good night's sleep. And they limit their feeding window to that between 8 and 12 hours. So that means they're going to eat generally around three times because if you take a human stomach and you fill it up with low-density foods, it takes about five to 700 calories of food. So you have to fill it up at least two or three times a day just to get enough to eat. And so by eating over a short window, it can help people avoid some of the particularly late night overeating, and it avoids, of course, the refined carbohydrates so they don't get the cravings. And actually, people get quite comfortable with this. And they, you'd think, oh, I'd be so hungry. But actually, that's not the case at all. They reach the tidy with those three large meals of low caloric density foods. And so it would be maybe you'd have some oatmeal in the morning, or you might have fresh fruit and greens, might have steamed vegetables. We have usually twice a day big salads, steamed vegetables, and some kind of potatoes, rice, or bean. And what we try to do is eat the salads and the low-density foods first, so we get lots of those in. And then we have the steamed vegetables, which are a little bit intermediate in terms of density. And then we try to have one generous portion of rice, beans, or some dish made with those kinds of things. If we're still hungry, that's fine. We go back and have another pound of salad. You're not going to get into trouble with salad and steamed vegetables because the caloric density is so low. Literally, there's not enough time in the day to achieve obesity eating salad. Salad, 100 calories a pound, you'd have to eat 20 pounds a day just to sustain yourself. And honestly, if you started at 6 a.m. and didn't stop till midnight, you're not going to really be able to do that. So that's the beautiful thing about this diet is you have to eat a lot, but you have to eat a lot of low-density foods. And you'll, you'll, your satiety mechanisms, your blood sugar mechanisms tend to stabilize. People feel very empowered because they're not fighting themselves biologically, because they're not getting that drug-like effect from all that sugar and the effects of the sugar that, as it goes into the diet. But the downside is it's, it's hard not to become a social outcast. Okay, because, okay. Actually, we want to get to that. Now, hold, yeah. hold that thought. Clarissa, let me jump in. I you know you want to ask about food, but now, now you've mentioned a, a number of times about the, uh, the potatoes and the rice and the beans. And one of the, I mean, as you probably know, there's a lot of people who are nervous about foods like that. And they, they will actually argue that basically from the keto community, which I want to talk about later. But the main concern there is that it raises the insulin for some people. So what do you yeah. say about that? Like, what about so people when they eat potatoes? 88% of carbohydrates eaten by people in industrialized countries are refined carbohydrates. Okay? Yeah. And yeah. most potatoes they're eating are served as French fries and potato chips. And so potatoes have, have an undeserved bad rap as uh -huh. an, an healthy food. However, it is true that the glycemic index, in other words, the, yes. the, the body's response to potatoes is different than, say, sweet potatoes or exactly. to squashes or other things. That's exactly and so, right. But the other thing that modulates glycemic response is the amount of fiber in the diet. So if you're eating potatoes with salads and vegetables, the glycemic response tends to be modulated. Now, you got to be very careful. Glycemic is response is just one biological parameter. For example, ice cream has a very low glycemic response, but you certainly wouldn't want to recommend that for weight control. Now, Right. People in the keto area are trying to utilize a biological adaptation of fasting. In fasting, there's a hunger blunting effect that kicks in that's associated with ketosis. Mm -hmm. So we know that that's helpful in when we do water fasting because people have no hunger after a couple of days because of the ketotic state. So that they said was, well, if we take all the carbohydrate out of the diet, healthy carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates, just all carbohydrates, yeah, yeah. all of our primary natural fuel, the brain will go into ketosis because there's no carbohydrate to maintain glycogen stores. Once glycogen stores are depleted, the only place yeah. that you're going to get energy is either fat or gluconeogenesis, freeing up some sugar from protein. And that hunger blunting, fasting, mimicking effect may be helpful for short-term weight loss for some people. The problem is that's not a health-promoting diet. So what's good for short-term gain may not be good for long-term health. Elaborate so we would, on that. Elaborate. We would not tell a person, well, let's just put you on a fast forever because no. eventually you reach the biological limit. And we wouldn't tell people, let's go on a high-fat, high-protein, dead Dr. Atkins diet forever because we know the consequences of that. The literature is very clear on that. There's all kinds of downstream effects from high-protein, high-fat diets. Now, many of the people have recognized that. 
And so they say, okay, well, we'll modify it from what has been recommended so aggressively over the years to a high fat, low protein, no carbohydrate diet. And that may be less bad, but something that's less bad doesn't make it good. It doesn't make it helpful. It just makes it somewhat less harmful. So you may be able to get away with that longer before you suffer the consequence. I do want to get, I uh, elaborate more on that, but, but before we get to that, I still, I still want to get that sense of what about somebody who's more carb sensitive or more insulin resistant, and they can't handle the carbs of, of, of potatoes or rice or something mm-hmm. like that. What do you do? So with that? If do you, you have you um, diabetics, for example, that are yeah. exquisitely have exquisite insulin resistance, what we yeah. found in our experience is the vast majority of Type 2 diabetics will achieve normal glycemic response, and we can continue to include these foods in the diet. Now, it's true that some foods like fruit juice and dried fruits, highly processed versions of fruit may be too sugary for these people. And even fruit itself is a hybridized, high-sugar, low-mineral content substance that we might have to limit for certain diabetics or certain insulin-sensitive people. But that's okay because we just give them more salad and steamed vegetables and potatoes, rice, and beans. But we do use complex carbohydrates. And even the American Diabetes Association recognizes a diet that's low in protein, moderate in fat, and high in complex carbohydrates as being the most effective strategy for managing diabetes. And and in my experience, that there's a transition period that may be necessary to allow people to be able to handle complex carbohydrates efficiently and effectively, but it's days or weeks. We do it a lot quicker because we use medically supervised water-only fasting. Which I want to get to later. By the time we're done fasting, their ability to handle complex carbohydrates is inevitably there. So, so basically, you're, you're saying that uh, for somebody who might be ultra-carb sensitive, that might just be a temporary, uh, if they follow an unrefi- unrefined food plan, that they will eventually be able to adapt to the complex carbs. Well, they can't. What, well, a lot of people tell you, though, is if they have any carbs, then they crave refined carbs, and then they have trouble resisting it. Yes. You know? and, so, and that's yeah. certainly you know, another issue. And so, again, I have the luxury where we have people in a controlled inpatient setting for a period of a week or two or three. So the hardest part of it, we can help them through that addictive transition. It's very much like alcoholics. Yeah. Some people can just quit. Yeah, we totally know, do that. And some people need more support to get yeah. through it. And so some people yeah. with their carbohydrate problems are very severe and they might need a little extra help rather than just good advice. They might need a little bit of a structured environment to help them get out right. of the toughest part of it. Now, can I ask you a question that you're going to cringe at, but but we really want to know because we're, we're I, I mean, I just want to say I'm so grateful that you as a plant-based person gets the concept of addiction the way that we do. And we need to have more of, of your experience in this world of food addiction because we don't hear the vegan side of it much. So one of the questions we have, I'm sorry you're going to cringe, is how do we eat, get enough protein in our oh, diet? Oh, sure. No, is not at all. That's a critical question. You know, yeah. most people are critically concerned because they've been miseducated, I think, to the degree that if they think if they don't eat meat or dairy, they're not going to get protein. The reality, though, is we know you need around 60 grams of high quality protein a day in order to sustain function, maybe a little more, a little less, depending on, you know, who the person is. If you just, let's just say you wanted to go on a really restricted diet for some reason, and all you did was eat brown rice and broccoli. Now, I'm not advocating this, but let's just say you just ate 2,000 calories a day of brown rice and broccoli. Mm -hmm. So six cups of rice, nine cups of broccoli you'd get 80 some grams of protein a day and all the essential amino acids. So even a brown rice and broccoli diet alone would be a little bit too concentrated from our viewpoint in protein in terms of Mm. you need to dilute it down with a little bit less concentrate. And that's without any nuts, seeds, beans, anything else. There is no problem getting a quality and quantity of protein, no matter how you break it down, with a variety of exclusively whole plant food diets. And if you include things like if you can eat lentils or peas or beans, if you can include nuts or seeds in the diet. I mean, it, then the challenge is even on a vegan diet, making sure you don't get too much of those ultra-rich foods. Because too much protein is actually a major problem in terms of kidney disease, cancer development, cardiovascular mm-hmm. disease. It's a highly underrated uh, health threat at an excessive level. Yeah, which I think is one of, one of the uh, uh, concerns that you have about the keto from what I could read. So can I, so let's, let's move to that area about the, so there you are talking about food addiction, sugar addiction, or the addictive component of food, which we totally go into or, or agree with. And so, you know, you're maintaining the abstinence of sugar, salt, oil, 
obviously high pro highly processed foods. So a vegan cheesecake is not something you would be advocating. No, a lot of these vegan foods are actually more That's health. Con I mean, it's really, you know, I get into Thank trouble. You. Elaborate speak at the, on this, please. I'll take, speak take, at the take national me. vegan conferences sometimes and talk about the fact, you know, most vegans are not vegans for health reasons or food addiction reasons. They're vegans because they want to save the planet. Yeah. And they know that animal husbandry may be responsible for more global warming effects than even the internal combustion engine. They want to save the animals because they believe in the moral, ethical, and spiritual factors. But health is way down on the list for most, most vegans. So at a vegan conference, I'll look around at the vendors, and they're selling highly processed fractionated sugar, oil, and salt satiated food. But because they don't have animal products, yeah. they're considered holy. You know, so Oreo cookies may be vegan, but they may not be healthy. Soda right. pot may be vegan, but it's certainly not healthy. French fries, potato chips. So my point was that as unhealthy as too much animal food might be, too much highly processed vegan crap could be even worse. And I've said that, you know, from a health standpoint, you might be better off eating meat than some of this highly processed. And, oh, they get very upset with me because, <laughs> you know, they don't like that. But yeah, the well, reality is if we just look you. at it from a health viewpoint, the sugar, the oil, the salt, these highly fractionated foods, that's the problem. People could eat, the people could choose to eat small coins if they didn't eat much of it, and they wouldn't have weight issues because meat, even though it might have some challenges from a health standpoint, is a whole food. Mm -hmm. So there's normal satiety feedback. You know, it's not, it's not the exception being dairy products, so ice cream and these things, highly processed. They got the best, the worst of both worlds. Ice cream is both an animal product with the biological concentration problems that you get from all animal foods, where materials accumulate. And there's a calorie of plant foods compared to a calorie of animal foods. The animal food could have two to a thousand times the biological concentration of toxins because of this idea of passing these toxins up the food chain. Hmm. Whereas plant foods can also have toxins, but they're not as biologically concentrated as they are in animal foods. Okay. Nonetheless, nonetheless, you could you could have you could build a case that people with small amounts of animal food and lots of plants would do better than people with lots of refined carbohydrates, even if they were vegan. Okay, so then let's look at where the, the real discrepancy seems to be with the keto and the vegan community. And that's not so much you're saying no meat, but there's an element of too much meat, whereas with the keto, it's like, that's okay. So what is it about the too much meat that is disturbing? Aside well, from the, so the, ethical the, the higher your animal food intake, yeah. the higher your TMA production in your in, in effect on your intestinal microbial. So the point is, yeah, if you ate small enough quantities of it, you may not see the significant detrimental effects that we see when you eat a lot of it. But let's be clear, if you're on a keto type diet and you're using animal foods, high protein, high fat diets, you will see the consequences, both in the microbiome changes, the constipation, the gallbladder disease, you'll see the cardiovascular risk factors all the way down the stream. There's no exemption of it. Now, granted, because you're not eating refined carbohydrates, exactly. you're getting which, quite which, a bit of benefit out of that, which, but it's not which, because of the meat. It's okay. because you're not eating refined carbohydrates. Well, that's what the keto folks say. It's not the meat. It's the fact that you're not eating the refined carbs. That's why you don't get the cancer and the, the heart disease and the diabetes. Well, what we do, we, we do see the health problems long term in people on high animal protein, high animal fat diets. I mean, there's no question about that. That literature is clear. So you can mitigate that by getting the protein out of it, but you still don't, you know, again, what's good for short-term success is not necessarily good for long-term health. What we do That's know, though, is people on a whole plant food diet, these are the long-lived populations, people that are re relying on minimally processed carbohydrates, whether it's potatoes or rice or beans or whatever culture you go to, those are the diets that are most associated with health. And in our own practice, I've been doing this for almost 40 years now. I've worked with yeah. 21,000 inpatients. We get yeah. to live with our patients. We see the consequences. People eating these diets, they normalize their blood pressure, their blood sugar levels. Yeah. Um, we reverse the lymphoma. We see the autoimmune disease. And we've published not just the case reports, but now clinical trials. You know, we've got a website, fasting.org, which is full of the clinical experience that we've had in peer-reviewed journals okay. demonstrating what happens. So we can show that this kind of whole plant food diet reverses disease and supports health. You, you will not see the same kind of support long-term when you're talking about high-protein, high-fat, animal-based diets. Okay. So, so hold that thought because I want to go back to that. But I, you said something a couple of minutes ago about since we've been eating uh, basically agricultural food, well, what do you say about the other side of that that says that it's since the agricultural revolution that we, we've actually seen the diminishment of health? I don't know if you've seen that literature. Well, but sure. But I mean, right now, the average person in the United States eats somewhere around 150 pounds of sugar and refined carbohydrates. 
hydrogen. Okay, so you're saying so, okay. Since 19 and we introduced in 1986, we introduced high fructose corn syrup. We we made we subsidize it. We make it cheap. We make sure that you know 25 percent of the calories. That agricultural that, revolution. They've said that since the agricultural revolution. Well, but there's a lot of things that have happened since the agricultural revolution. Uh, okay. Not the least of which is changes in activity levels, changes in dietary habits. We've got you know, populations that become much wealthier, higher and higher proportional amount yeah. of refined carbohydrates. Yeah. I mean, you've got to be a little careful about cause and effect associations here. I'm not disagreeing that post-industrial revolution, there's been a lot of health compromising habits, not the least of which changes into our environment itself, the way people live, the stress levels, population issues. I mean, we can get a whole long list of problems that we've created. Okay. Well, thank you. I really appreciate your answering these questions. Like, really? Okay. So, so now, super interested in um, your area of fasting. So you know that the, the whole world of intermittent fasting exists in the keto world. I'm like, I didn't realize that the, the vegan plant-based had their own version of that. So can you give your perspective about that and then ultimately how that feeds into uh, the food addiction? Well, I think that, you know, again, limiting feeding window to 8 to 12 hours, I don't think that's uh, unique. I think that many of the people in many of these groups recognize that might be helpful. The only thing we disagree on is what you should put in your face during the feeding window. And what we're advocating is a whole plant food diet. So fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. So that's it. Not meat, fish, fowl, eggs, dairy products, oil, salt, and sugar, and particularly not refined carbohydrates. So the sugars and the flours, and basically that's a huge part of people's diet. Just walk through the grocery store. And look yeah. at what the huge volume is. It's mostly heavily federally subsidized grains with a lot of sugar oil and salt pressed into different sizes and colored different colors. All that packaged food makes up the majority. 93% of the calories consumed by people in industrialized countries yeah. are pleasure trap chemicals, oil, yeah, salt, yeah, sugar, yeah. flour, and animal foods. Yeah, 7% got is fruits and vegetables. Yeah, we're with you on this one. Yeah. Now, tell us now about your 40-day fast, and because that that's, that just blows my mind. How does that, It sounds like you're saying it resets us so that we yeah. can eat complex carbs. Elaborate so, on the theory. People are sick because they have long-term dietary excess. They develop obesity, metabolic syndrome, and all the downstream consequences. So it's not shocking to find out that if you don't eat, you would lose weight. So people that are fasting lose an average of a pound a day of weight loss. And what we've discovered, we've done a study, which you can go onto our website and, and look at it, what happens to body composition during fasting and then subsequently was refeeding. And we even have one year of follow-ups now. Mm-hmm. And what happens is you lose fat, uh, fiber, uh, water, glycogen, and car, you know, protein during fasting. And when, but it turns out the majority of calories are derived from fat. And preferentially visceral fat, the type of fat that, is, uh, that surrounds your organs, your abdominal fat that's most associated with inflammation and compromised health. So, look, for example, a person might lose 4% of their body weight in a two-week fast, but they'd lose 20% of their adipose tissue and maybe 50% of their visceral fat and 4% of lean protein. And then with refeeding on the diet that we advocate, what happens is the protein, water, fiber, glycogen are recovered, but the fat continues to go down. And we've used a DEXA scanner to do this detailed whole body composition. And again, at, during fasting, after fasting, six-week follow-up and one-year follow-up. And, and in fact, what we have been able to show is people that sustain these diets sustain progressive fat loss. They preserve their protein. They replenish their glycogen stores. And so, so it, it are you can be that useful... One, are you saying that one fast will, will sustain itself that you don't have to keep doing a 40-day fast every year or something Well, like not that. even a 40-day fast. Most of these patients are fasting between five days and three weeks. It's very Mm -hmm. rare that we have to go to the extremes of 40 days. 40 days is usually uh, some of our patients from FOMA with fibroid tumors that have very serious issues. It takes such a long time to correct the problem. Uh, Most of our patients, if weight and say blood pressure are the only issues, they might only be fasting five days, 10 days, maybe 15 days, enough to normalize pressure, get rid of the need for medication. You're not trying to get rid of all the fat by fasting. It's trying to get the palate sensitized. For example, we've done a study on taste adaptation. People crave sugar, oil, and salt. If they stop eating it, it goes away. For example, if you uh, put people on low-salt diets for about a month, their cravings for the salt goes down. Well, that happens very quickly, even a few days in fasting. If you put people on a low-fat diet, it takes quite a while, about three months for people to satiate to a low-fat diet. But it happens very quickly with fasting. So it's not the weight loss that's uh, the benefit in fasting. It's the ability to get people to enjoy the taste and flavor of healthy foods. So right. people that are struggling, you know, not liking their diet because it's disgusting, tasteless, swill, whole foods. But after fasting, they taste better. 
And so it gets, it's easy to make easier for some people to make that transition to a healthy diet. Also, they're off their medications. And believe me, these medications can have profound effects on weight loss. If you're on steroid medications, if you're on hypertensive medications, it can affect apostatic mechanisms. It can affect how you feel. And people that are depressed and feel lousy have trouble extra effort into making dietary change. People that feel good, they're in a supportive environment. They have some encouragement. They have some hope. Their ability to make these difficult choices much better than people that think it's helpless and hopeless and all they, you know, they just, they give. And so that's part of the benefits. It's not just fasting. They're also in a supportive environment. They're getting educated. They're in a place where people are supporting them instead of antagonizing them. And where other people are, are struggling also to make diet and lifestyle changes, that can be very helpful. I think, again, an analogy is alcoholism. You know, when people are trying to quit drinking, sometimes it helps to be around people that aren't giving them a hard time because they're not drinking. Uh-huh. Well, so just go back to the fasting thing. Is there, are there ever um, people that you would discourage fasting? Because- yes, there's a number of, in fact, you know, there's a large number of people that are not good candidates for fasting. So there's a number of contraindications. That's why it's so important. Before anybody fasts, it's necessary to get history exam and -hmm. laboratory evaluation to determine if you're a fasting candidate. You know, some of the things that are contraindications to fasting are pretty obvious. If you're pregnant or lactating, Mm -hmm. fasting may not be for you. If you try to fast while you're lactating, it won't be long before you'll lose milk production as the body goes into conservation. If you have anorexia or nervosa, this is a neurological condition. These patients want to fast, but fasting is not for them. It's not going to be helpful at resolving the condition. If you have type 1 diabetes, you can't fast because you don't produce enough insulin. And insulin is necessary to adapt to the fasting process. Now, type 2 diabetics do great. And about 80% of our type 2 diabetics will achieve normal blood sugar without medication post-fast. If you've had a recent stroke, myocardial infarction, if you have atrial fibrillation, if you're on anticoagulant therapy, you can't just discontinue that medication without risk arbitrarily. It has to be done slowly over time. So, And you don't fast on anticoagulant therapy. So those patients, we would do a modified approach. We wouldn't do water-only fasting. If you have had a severe kidney disease, you know, if your creatinine is over 2.0, if you have too low a GFR, fasting would put a lot of load on this detoxifying organ called the kidney and may be detrimental. So we wouldn't fast patients if their kidney function isn't enough to adapt to it. If you have genetic defects like a porphyria, or a medium chain acetylcoenzyme A dehydrogenous deficiency. You wouldn't be able to break down fatty acids and you wouldn't be able to fast. You'd develop serious problems and, and uh, have problems. If you have depletion, de- cachexia, if you're in a, de- a depletion disease, that may not be a good intervention for you. And if you can't rest, it's necessary to rest when people are fasting because once you deplete your glycogen stores after about 48 hours of fasting, if you're active, the only way your muscles get that sugar that it needs is breaking down protein from gluconeogenesis. Mm-hmm. And so we want to preserve protein and maximize fat loss, and that means resting when you're fasting, which is a little contraintuitive. People think, well, if I exercise more, I'll lose more fat. Well, we're not just trying to lose fat. We're trying to reboot your whole system, and that requires rest. So if you have uh, fear of fasting is, is a contraindication. Fear is a very expensive emotion. Mm-hmm. And I honestly think that the stress people under uh, produces excess steroid production internally. And we already know that too much steroid production can be associated with weight gain and, and difficulty with weight loss. So I think a lot of times when people are under too much stress, they have trouble with weight loss just from the stress. Yeah. So let me stop you there because this is great. So one of the things that I hear you saying, and I'm really glad you're saying this, is that this is a medical intervention. It should not be something somebody just does willy-nilly on their own. No, the intermittent fasting they can do on their own, the, yes. the, the, yeah. the, the, eight, 12, the 12 yeah. to 16 hours. But the longer term fasting, mm-hmm. history, exam, and lab, yeah. and better it done in a supportive environment where you can be monitored twice a day and not run into problems. This is no, not a weight a, loss strategy. Yeah, there's a, exactly. I totally agree. There's a lot of people who think, well, I'll just do it for a week on my own. And yeah, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. What I'd recommend instead is a high nutrient density, low caloric density diet with rest. In other words, if you do fruits and salads, for example, if you have big salads and steamed vegetables, you're getting 6,800 calories and you're kind of easy, just exercise. You will lose as much fat as you would if you went on a water-only fast. So if your goal is fat loss, which hopefully that's what people's focus is, you can do that without ever fasting. Low caloric, high nutrient density diet with moderate activity and plenty of sleep. And the one thing I think, if people really want to lose weight and keep it off, I think one of the real secrets is they've got to sleep more and they've got to eat more. They've got to eat more low-density foods. 
Mm. and they've got to sleep more so they have energy and higher metabolic rate so that they can do their exercise and carry on their functions. And what people do is they don't sleep enough and they don't eat enough. So what would you say to the individuals, like I have clients that I work with, and sometimes they tell me that they don't find plant-based foods satiate them as right. much as right. when they consume the animal foods. It's because they don't satiate themselves as much as the animal foods because the animal foods are many times higher caloric density. So when you eat the plant-based foods, you have to eat more. And most people are so worried about overeating and they're weighing and they're measuring and they're doing all this stuff. It really can be counterproductive with this kind of approach. You don't weigh and measure salads because they're 100 calories a pound. It doesn't, if you're weighing it, it's to make sure you get enough. And people that go on this diet at first, they're used to eating small portions and they're trying to, and now we're saying, no, you have to have a big salad and bunch of steamed vegetables and they feel self-conscious and guilty. And, and people might look at them and say, oh my gosh, you're not going to eat all that, are you? How can you lose weight when you're eating like a pig? And they have all these images in their heads. Well, this is a situation where with the low uh, caloric density foods, if you don't eat enough, you won't get enough calories and then your brain will think you're starving and you won't be successful. You have to eat more. And yeah, we know. have to train people. No, no, it's okay to eat yeah. more. When, and, when, but, yeah. when Chef AJ told me she eats like two pounds of veggies at lunchtime, yeah. I was like, wow, really? Yeah. Right. And, and the problem with Chef AJ is sometimes she doesn't have enough time because she's so busy. And uh, it takes some time to eat two pounds of veggies. And so we always have to nag her to make sure she takes enough time so she can eat all the food that she needs to maintain her nice spelt figure. Because uh, as soon as you stop eating enough, then you get the hunger and the cravings. You don't want that. Okay. We don't want people to have to fight their biology. So let's we don't want them to spend their lives, you know, undermining themselves by not recognizing that it's okay to eat healthy quantities of healthy foods. It's just okay. not okay to eat large quantities of those processed foods. Okay, so now let, let's let's apply this to food addiction, where some some people are volumatic, so that they love the idea that they can eat endlessly, but they're volumatics. So how would you apply your program of, of food and fasting for for food addiction specifically? Well, again, the only the only foods that we tend to be kind of portion control, and, and again, we're not so much weighing and measuring, it's just well, portion control, are things like the highly concentrated plant-based foods. So the nuts and the seeds, the avocado. And so, you know, we talk about those, some people can't eat those foods at all because they find they're concentrated enough in calories, they can be a bit of a food trigger. So for those people, we just hold off those. There's no one food that everybody has to eat in order to get good nutritional density. You need a variety of whole plant foods. You can eat fruits, you can eat vegetables. You can, and if, you know, if that's all you're comfortable with right now, you just eat a variety of fruits and vegetables. And you can sustain that, that type of a diet indefinitely. The advantage to including the more dense foods, the potatoes, the rice, the beans, is that you don't have to eat quite so much volume in order to meet your caloric needs. So it sounds a little bit weird, but we're actually doing the opposite. Our struggle is getting people to eat enough of these low density foods. And even people that have trouble with, with food binging and stuff, um, again, there can be psychological to be considered, but the biological ones are usually not getting satiety. And most patients find after they've been eating this diet for a while, they find naturally that they're reaching satiation. We found for with even people that have severe problems when they're at the center and, they're, and we're getting large quantities of these foods that they start getting quite comfortable. And then they start noticing, oh, even though I may have, quote, over eight by volume, I'm losing weight. I'm, I have control. And that sense of control seems for many people to be kind of the, the limiting factor. They've got to feel like they understand what's going on and right. they can see the results. Yeah, so there's that sense of control. And then you mentioned earlier on before my cat fight there that the concept of stress, uh, if a person is stressed and they're afraid to do an intermittent fast yeah. or, or a fasting or they're afraid to follow something, that, that we need to listen to that as well. Absolutely. You know, people think, for example, if they were to get on a plane in New York, and they were to fly all the way to California, that they would probably die over Colorado from starvation unless they ate the pretzels. They think the pretzels saved their life. One of the things we find, once people have gone through, say, two or three weeks of fasting, they realize, oh, they don't have to worry if they don't eat for an hour or two. It's okay. They're not going to die. And if you've got their blood sugar levels stable, so their brain isn't telling them they're starving, they're not getting the, the, the cravings, it's much easier to make better decisions. But, you know, I don't want to pretend that this is easy. I would say adopting a health-promoting diet in a world designed to make you 
overweight and sick and miserable is probably the most difficult thing most people ever do. And for people that have eating disorders, it's maybe doubly difficult. They have to work way harder than other people just to get the same results. Yeah. So actually that, that was the sort of next area or maybe last area we want to focus on. And that is the living in the world that doesn't follow this kind of an understanding and also just obstacles that you face professionally. Can you elaborate on living in the world and obstacles? Well, the biggest challenge people have at first is they think they'll never get, they'll never like their food again. You know, they're addicted. It's just like smokers think their life won't be worth living if they're not smoking. They'd rather die than quit smoking. And well, then they do. But uh, alcoholics think their, you know, life wouldn't be enjoyable if they weren't a drunk, uh, be able to get drunk. But, you know, if you talk to people that quit smoking or drinking, they don't tell you that their life is, was better then than it is now. They may have slip and fall into skin. And I don't get people that have had histories of struggling with eating disorders that get stabilized and say, oh, it wasn't worth the trouble, you know, to all the social challenges and all that. But they do say it's probably the most difficult thing they've ever done. And I think it's even more difficult just because of social issues for women than men. I think women pay a bigger price and it takes more effort that to do, accomplish the same things than it, it does for men. And I think there's reasons for that. There's a psychologist named Farrell who ta- wrote a book called when, Why Men Are the Way They Are, which is probably really more about why women are the way they are. And he talks about a lot of these psychological issues and how much harder it is for women and, than men, everything else being equal. And I think there's probably some truth to that. So if you're a woman and you have to work harder, then, you know, well, it's probably not just in this, it's probably everything. So you better get used to it, you know. So where can our listeners find you? One of the services we would offer to your listeners that might be of use is we offer a free phone conversation with me. If they go onto our website at truenorthhealth.com and complete what are called registration forms, which gets me their medical history, I'll review that. They can call me and I'll answer any questions I can. I can refer them to a, a doctor, either a remote doctor that does this kind of work, or if they have a doctor nearer them than True North Health Center, we can refer them to facilities if they want to do inpatient care, if they want to do fasting. And so I'm happy to talk to them, answer the questions as best I can, get them information. There's no cost for that uh, to talk to me anyway. And they can go to our website, truenorthhealth.com, to do that. We also have our fasting website, which is all the research we've published on fasting. They can access that uh, on either website. They can get access to our lectures and podcasts and all that kind of stuff. We have a lot of educational content. They can even tune in through our website to my live lectures at our inpatient facility on Mondays at 2 p.m. And here, you know, us answering questions and, and giving talks and presentations. Again, everything we have is freely available. And, uh, you know, True North Health Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit research facility. We are engaged in clinical research. We are involved in training doctors. If you have physicians that want to do something really worthwhile with their life and learn how to get sick people well, they can come. We provide training free or in training facility for any primary care physicians that want to learn how to use fasting or nutritional medicine in managing conditions. And any of your clinicians out there that might have a question about a patient or applying these principles to their patients, they can call me. There's no cost. Just give me a call anytime. I'm happy to talk to you. Great. That's Thanks. great to hear. Yeah. So we have a signature question and it is, if you could tell a younger version of yourself something about sugar addiction, what would it that be? If you really want to address the reason why people have weight issues, you can't do it, in my experience, long-term, healthfully, without adjusting, addressing sugar and refined carbohydrates. There's probably the single biggest controllable influence that's necessary, and it's probably the, the biggest hidden addiction that we've got out there is sugar and refined carbohydrates. You know, oil and fats are a problem. Animal products can be a problem. But, but sugars, if you could solve that problem, you'd largely solve a lot of the suffering that people are doing. And we would have a profound revolution on health uh, in this country. It's also going to be the most heavily defended. So you can bet anytime you try to address this, there's going to be a lot of people objecting to it. Okay, well, Dr. Goldhammer, thank you so much. Uh, for people listening, you, uh, you've got to read The Pleasure Trap. It's a must read, and especially for people who are vegan and interested in food addiction. Thank you so much for it's coming. My pleasure. On. And if you don't like reading, Chef AJ actually professionally <laughs> recorded The Pleasure Trap in an audio version. He did. And for those that don't like to read, she's done a brilliant job. I of, listened uh, to recording it last that for week. us. We're really yeah. grateful to her. So you can listen to it if you don't want to read it, but do get that The Pleasure Trap because I think it'll bend your mind. Yeah, yeah, I, I second that. 
Anyway, thank you so much for coming on. My honor. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.